First off today, brace yourself for a truly bone-chilling account from a reliable witness who still carries the psychological scars of what he encountered on that trail. This is an event so outside the bounds of normal phenomena that it will force you to think about creatures and concepts that we can barely conceive. You are about to hear Michael's story. Hey everyone, my name is Michael and I want to say thanks for taking the time to hear my account. I'll do my best to lay out all the details of what happened as clearly as I can. Just a fair warning though, this is going to be a long one since there's a lot of background and context I want to provide. So as I mentioned, my name is Michael and I'm 37 years old, living with my wife Karen and our two kids in the town of Ellicott City, Maryland. We actually just moved into a new house there, back in 2021 after having our second child. Nice little suburban area, very family friendly. I mostly work from home for a tech company, doing software implementation and IT support. My childhood buddy Steve has been my best friend since we were kids growing up in Baltimore County. He works as an electrician and lives maybe 20 minutes away with his wife and son. Even though we've both gotten married and had kids, Steve and I have made an effort to try to get together pretty regularly, just us two, to shoot the breeze and hang out like when we were younger. Our main hobby that we've gotten into over the last few years is hiking. Now I have to caveat this by saying, we're definitely not intense or extreme hikers by any means. We're just a couple of average dudes looking to go on decent length hikes, take in some nature, get some exercise and catch up without any distractions from the daily grind. This whole bizarre situation I'm about to describe took place back in October of 2023. The weather was just about perfect that time of year. Crisp fall air, sunshine, leaves changing colors. Pretty much ideal hiking conditions in my opinion. Steve always likes to try out new trails. So for this particular Saturday, he had discovered a section of the Appalachian Trail in Pennsylvania, about two hours from where we live. To be more specific, it was the section that runs through the South Mountain region, just northwest of Frederick, Maryland absolutely gorgeous area from what I could tell from the pictures and trail descriptions Steve showed me. Lots of forests, rocky terrain, good uphill climbing with some awesome vistas and overlooks. We've done hiking around that general area before, but never directly on the Appalachian Trail itself. So we were pretty jazzed to check it out. We got an early start, as we usually do for hikes, meeting up at my place around 6.30 a.m., downed a few cups of coffee, stuffed our lightweight backpacks with snacks, water, basic survival gear, etc. And we were on our way, arriving at the Appalachian Trail parking area around 8.15 a.m., I'd say. Those first few hours of the hike were totally routine and normal. Just us guys shooting the breeze about work, family life, telling inappropriate jokes like we've always done, taking in the sights as we ascended some pretty steep inclines enjoying the crisp air and solitude of being out in nature. At one point, we stopped for a snack break at this little clearing area off the side of the trail, which is when things started getting weird. I had been leaning up against this big boulder, sipping on some water and eating a granola bar. That's when I noticed this sort of mist beginning to form in the middle of the clearing, swirling almost in a circular pattern. Now, I've hiked enough to know that kind of dynamic mist behavior is pretty unusual especially given the clear skies and decent weather we were having. So I pointed it out to Steve, who was sitting on a log a few feet away from me. We both stood up and started slowly approaching the peculiar mist, squinting to try and get a better look. The closer we got, the more I began to notice this sort of greenish tint or glow to the swirling mist, which seemed incredibly odd. I remember feeling almost in a trance-like state, just focused in on this spinning green mist, as we approached closer, Steve and I weren't saying anything at this point, almost like we were under its spell, so to speak. Looking back, I also recall what sounded like a very faint whirring or grinding noise, which seemed to be coming from the mist itself. Very subtle, but definitely there. Then, everything happened extremely quickly after that. Once we were about 20 feet or so away from the center of the swirling mist, suddenly, an incredibly loud, screeching, mechanical grinding sound exploded outwards. So loud and high-pitched that Steve and I literally buckled over, 
covering our ears in searing pain from the noise. At the same time, this deafening grinding noise started. The swirling green mist rapidly expanded outwards, quickly enveloping and surrounding both me and Steve. I could feel the thickness and density of the mist physically pressing in against my body from all sides. It was like being smothered by a thick, metallic fog. As strange as it sounds, I could taste metal on my tongue and smell something almost like electrical burning in the air around me. The vibrations from the grinding noise seemed to be resonating through every cell and bone in my body in an incredibly uncomfortable way. Then, just as suddenly as the chaos started, everything went completely silent and still again. The impenetrable green mist dissipated and I could finally see my surroundings again. But what I saw made my jaw drop and legs go weak with shock and confusion. The natural forest clearing we had been standing in was gone, replaced by some kind of metallic or concrete ground covering. And stranger still, there were these large curved arches or protrusions evenly spaced out in a circle throughout the area, almost like they had been raised up out of the ground itself. I looked over at Steve with complete bewilderment on my face, and he had the same dumbfounded expression. Before either of us could say a word, that's when things took an even more bizarre and terrifying turn. From behind and between the curved arches, these things started emerging and surrounding us in a circle. I have no other way to describe them except they looked like some kind of hybrid cross between an ant and a praying mantis, but easily five six feet tall, standing upright and moving in an unnaturally stiff, robotic way. Their bodies seemed to be encased in this shiny, jet-black exoskeleton that had an almost metallic sheen. The faces, if you could call them that, looked almost artificially designed with those huge black eyes that gave no indication of anything lying behind them, no discernible mouth or other features. There were around 10 or 12 of these nightmarish insect creatures that slowly materialized and surrounded me and Steve in a tight circle, almost penning us in. They just stood there bodiless, their hollow black eyes seemingly judging and observing us while making no sound or movement otherwise. Steve and I were utterly paralyzed by fear, panic, and confusion. We made no effort to communicate with these beings, and they made no attempt to communicate with us. We simply stood there surrounded, like specimens in a horrific zoo exhibit. The tension was suffocating. I couldn't even hear my own racing thoughts over the adrenaline pumping through my veins. Were these creatures extraterrestrial in origin? Some unknown beings from another dimension? Horrific mythological creatures made real. I had no answers, only pounding uncertainty and dread over whatever would happen next. Then, after what felt like an eternity, but was likely only a few minutes, the creatures did something just as peculiar as their arrival. In a display of perfect unison and robotic coordination, they turned their backs to us and started marching away, disappearing single file behind one of the curved arch structures that dotted the area. Steve and I watched in shocked silence as the last of the insect beings disappeared behind the arch. As soon as it did, the entire arch and arched ring surrounding the area started descending perfectly downwards back into the metallic ground, almost like an iris closing, until they had sealed over completely. The only indication they had ever been there was the perfectly smooth metallic ground surface, extending out probably 100 feet from where we stood. After another few minutes, even that unnatural ground began to buckle and crack. Plants, dirt, and tree roots started punching up through the surface cracks until the entire area reverted back to the natural forest setting it had been before. Steve and I didn't even give ourselves a chance to try and process what the hell had just happened. We turned and sprinted, no, ran back towards the Appalachian Trail and our car as fast as our legs could carry us, not daring to look back. I've never experienced such sheer fight or flight level panic in my entire life. When we finally made it back to the parking area, we peeled out doing probably 60 miles an hour down the forest access road, driving in complete silence for the two hour car ride home. I don't think either of us even had the vocabulary to describe what we had just witnessed. It wasn't until we got back to my place in Ellicott City 
that the shock began to wear off and we could actually try to put voice to the insanity we had experienced out on that trail. We went inside, grabbed a couple beers, and just started recounting every single detail to each other of what had transpired. Steve described the creatures and surroundings in an almost identical way to how I had perceived them. That felt vindicating in a weird way, to have that shared reality confirmed even though it was utterly outside the realm of normal reality. We went back and forth for probably a couple hours, analyzing it from every angle, but just kept going in circles. What were those beings? Where did they come from? Was it some kind of ultra-terrestrial encounter or interdimensional experience? Were they guarding some kind of facility or portal in those woods? The questions were endless and completely unanswerable with our limited context. When our wives got home later that evening, we gave them a heavily redacted version of events leaving out the most mind-bending details for their own peace of mind. In the weeks and months that followed, I'll admit I became a bit obsessed with trying to research and find any shred of explanation for our experience. I read any book, website, or message board posting I could find relating to UFOs, cryptozoology, interdimensional theory, literally anything that could conceivably provide a framework for what we witnessed. I drove back out to that same area of the Appalachian Trail probably half a dozen times, hiking the vicinity looking for any kind of residual evidence, but never found anything out of the ordinary. The PTSD-like effects of the encounter eventually did begin to fade, but I'll always be what I saw branded into my psyche. These days, Steve and I still get together for hikes every few weeks, but we stick to tamer, local trails for the most part. Too many bad memories and paranoia around a reoccurrence of that day. We've learned to accept that there's just some experiences in this life that simply defy human understanding or logic. All I know is that there are aspects of reality and potentially entire worlds or dimensions out there that most of us are completely oblivious to in our normal day-to-day -day existences. Forces at play that are unfathomable to our finite primate minds. My blissful skepticism when it came to the paranormal was shattered that day out on the trail, never to recover. So that's my story in its entirety. I've tried to the best of my recollection to faithfully recount exactly what happened in an honest and sober manner. I'm under no delusions that most who read this will immediately dismiss it as drug-addled ramblings or a fanciful creative writing piece. But I don't care. I know what I saw and experienced. And if anything, I hope my account plants at least a kernel of insight or awareness that there are stranger things in this universe than are dreamt of in most people's philosophies. If anyone out there has had any remotely similar encounters or has theories about what I may have stumbled upon that day, I'm all ears. I've resigned myself to perhaps never getting a definitive answer, but closure and insight from a fresh perspective would be welcomed. Thanks for reading through my insane tale. Here's to keeping an open mind about the great unknowns of our existence. Cheers. Mike was a totally normal guy who lived an ordinary blue collar life in a quiet Akron suburb. To the outside world, he and his wife seemed like thousands of other typical American households. But what no one could have imagined were the bizarre, inexplicable events that Mike witnessed over the course of a year. Events that would make even the most hardened skeptics question reality itself. The following is the information he shared with us. I should start by telling you a bit about myself. My name is Mike and I'm 37 years old. I live in a normal suburban neighborhood in Akron, Ohio with my wife, Sarah. We're about as regular as couples come around here. I've worked at the same auto manufacturing plant for the past 15 years putting together parts for car engines and transmissions. Sarah is a nurse at the local hospital, working three 12-hour shift rotations each week. Up until a few years ago, I would have told you I'm about as skeptical as they come when it comes to all the paranormal, supernatural, alien, and cryptid stuff you hear about online and on TV shows. I'm a firm believer in only believing what I can see with my own two eyes. Well, after the strange series of events I experienced starting in late 2020, let's just say I'm a lot more open-minded nowadays. It all started on a chilly November night. 
I had just finished up watching some TV. Sarah was working an overnight shift at the hospital. Around 11 p.m., I remembered that I needed to take the trash cans out to the curb for pickup the next morning before I forgot. I put on my Browns hoodie and headed out the side door to the driveway, pulling the two large rolling bins behind me. As I got towards the end of the driveway, I couldn't help but notice how dead silent it was outside. Like weirdly, uncannily silent. No cars driving by, no barking dogs, not even any crickets chirping. Just total silence. Anyway, I lined up the bins at the curb and started heading back towards the house. That's when I caught a glimpse of something over by the tree line at the back end of my yard. At first, I thought it must be some animal like a deer, raccoon, or even a stray dog. But as I turned to look, I realized pretty quickly that wasn't the case at all. What I saw was this figure or shape or something. I'd estimate around six and a half or seven feet tall from the glimpse I got. It seemed incredibly thin and lanky, with disproportionately long arms and legs, but it was hunched over and basically glided across the ground in this really unnatural way instead of walking. The strangest part, though, was its skin or surface or whatever you want to call it. It seemed to have this dull greenish tint, almost like a glow, but not quite. Like if you took some green glow sticks and stuffed them under a tarp or something. That's probably the closest thing I can compare it to. I just stood there staring at this thing in total disbelief as it moved sort of parallel to the tree line behind my yard. It never looked my way or seemed to notice me at all. Eventually, it passed behind some tall shrubs and I didn't see it again after that. I probably stood there for a good 30 seconds or so before heading back inside, my heart pounding out of my chest. When Sarah got home around 8 a.m., I immediately told her what I had seen, but she just seemed to think there was a logical explanation. Plus, she was super tired and didn't want to think about what I was telling her. I tried to convince her I wasn't making it up, but she didn't seem to believe me. I'll admit, if I was in her shoes, I probably would have reacted the same way. It all just sounded so far-fetched and crazy. But that was just the start of the weirdness. Over the next year or so, I witnessed a number of strange occurrences that still defy any logical explanation, as far as I can tell. A couple weeks after that first sighting of the bizarre glowing figure, I had another one of the strangest experiences of my life. It was around 3 a.m. and I woke up feeling really disoriented and confused. At first I thought maybe I had just had an intense dream or something. But then I realized I was completely paralyzed, unable to move a single muscle in my body. I could see the room perfectly normal, could hear the sound of the heat kicking on downstairs, but I legitimately could not move or speak at all. It was like I was trapped inside my own body. I started to panic, feeling claustrophobic, almost like the room was closing in around me. I struggled as hard as I could to move or make any noise to wake up Sarah next to me, but nothing worked. Then after what felt like an eternity, maybe only a couple minutes, Everything went back to normal and I could move again. I jolted upright in bed in a cold sweat, heart racing a mile a minute. Sarah woke up asking if I was okay, but I played it off like it was just a bad dream so she wouldn't think I was losing my mind. Later on, I read that the experience I had fit the description of something called sleep paralysis. Apparently, it has to do with your mind waking up before your body does leaving you trapped in a paralyzed state for a short time. All I knew was that it was one of the most disturbing, unsettling experiences I've ever had. Not long after that, it seemed like every few nights I would see strange lights or objects in the sky that didn't resemble anything I could rationally explain. A couple times they appeared to be triangular craft with lights at each point, just hovering silently without moving. Other times, it looked like bright orbs of light dancing across the sky in an erratic pattern. At first, I thought they must be drones or planes, but their movements made no sense. These things could make crazy, abrupt directional changes that no known aircraft is capable of. I started looking into UFO sightings more and reading about the different shapes and types of craft that get reported. While I still can't say with certainty what I was seeing, I know it wasn't anything normal. Then the creepiest of all the incidents happened one morning in late January. It had snowed a couple inches overnight, 
covering everything in a fresh coating of undisturbed white powder. I got up early as usual for work around 6 a.m. to warm up my truck, before scraping off the snow. As I walked up to the driver's side, I noticed something strange about the windshield. There were these weird impressions or prints in the snow, like something had been crouching or pressed up against the glass. But they didn't look like normal handprints or footprints at all, more like smudges or blurs in the snow. I brushed it off at first, thinking maybe it was just an odd way that the snow had accumulated overnight, or even possibly some neighborhood kids messing around earlier that morning before school. But then I noticed the print sort of trailed off towards the ground on the passenger side of the truck, leading away into my yard towards the tree line out back. I immediately thought back to that figure I had seen gliding across my yard a few months earlier. Was this evidence that something had been checking out my truck in the middle of the night? The more I tried to comprehend it, the creepier the whole thing became. So in the end, those are just a few of the weird isolated incidents I've had. But there were plenty of other little occurrences that still have me scratching my head. I don't know if they're all related or if they mean anything or if I'm just working myself up and making a mountain out of a molehill. Anyway, thanks for letting me put this out there and let me know if you have any ideas. You think you know fear? Real, purebred, blood-curdling terror? Trust me, until you've come face to face with something inhuman, you don't know the meaning of the word. What Bill and I experienced that August night in the bowels of that accursed factory, it wasn't just disturbing, it was a wake-up call. I've been a police officer here in Fairfield County, Connecticut for 12 years now. It's a pretty quiet town for the most part just outside of New Haven. Yeah, we get our fair share of disorderly drunks, petty criminals, that kind of thing. But I can't say anything could have had me ready for the bizarre, terrifying experience I had one night in August 2021. My partner Bill and I were just wrapping up the night shift around 2 a.m. Friday morning. We were out on patrol as usual, just doing a loop around town to kill the last hour before shift change. Quiet night, Bill said, stifling a yawn from the driver's seat. Barely anything on the radios. He was right. It had been a real snoozer of a shift. Not much more than a couple of fender benders and a drunk and disorderly at the local pub. Then the radio crackled with a report of suspicious activity at an old abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. Apparently, a concerned caller reported strange lights coming from within the dilapidated building. Ah, hell, Bill sighed. It'll probably be nothing, I told him. May as well go knock it out. Nine times out of ten, it's just some dumb kids partying or pulling pranks. We drove the few miles down Main Street to where the derelict factory compound squatted on the other side of a desolate stretch of cracked pavement and overgrown fields. The place has been closed for years since the 80s. Even from the road, the place looked like a total dump. The factory was this towering series of soot-stained brick buildings with hundreds of busted windows like empty eye sockets. Rusted metal fencing surrounded it, though large sections had been torn or broken down over time. Bill killed the headlights as we cruised through the open factory gate and up the bumpy access road toward the loading docks area out back. Our aim was to move in quietly, taking anyone inside by surprise if possible. When we pulled around to the rear of the building complex, I could already see something wasn't right. Sure enough, flickering lights danced across the dirt lot and busted windows of one section of the factory. But no voices or music, just an eerie silence. I looked over at Bill and he just shrugged. Throwing the cruiser in park, we both climbed out, hands on our service weapons. That's when we got hit with this smell. I've smelled some putrid things in my years on the force. Dumpsters stuffed with rotting food. Homeless folks who haven't bathed in weeks. But this stench, it was like a slaughterhouse trash pit concentrated into a thick, impenetrable fog. Bill gagged and covered his mouth and nose with his arm. Holy hell, what is that smell? Did something die in there? Fighting my own urge to vomit, I switched on my flashlight and advanced toward the dimly lit part of the building approaching a set of massive steel doors hanging wide open. Inside, I could see more flickering light cast across the floor, but the source was unclear. 
As we got closer, the stench became even more overpowering. It smelled like rotting meat and raw sewage had been blended into a napalm smoothie. Keep it together, I muttered as much for myself as Bill. Moving in side by side, we shone our lights inside, and that's right before all hell broke loose. Gripping our flashlights tightly, Bill and I moved through those rusted steel doors into the factory's main floor. Even with our lights cutting through the shadows, we could barely make out our surroundings. Twisted piles of metal, old machinery, broken glass, and debris were strewn everywhere. It looked like the place had been abandoned in a hurry decades ago. Our lights played across rows of towering metal shelving units that stretched in both directions as far as we could see. The air was choked with so much dust, it almost looked like a thick fog. And that smell, somehow it was even worse inside, like we'd stepped into the digestive tract of a massive rotting beast. This is so screwed up, Bill whispered, his voice wavering. I don't like this one bit. I was about to suggest we call for backup when, up ahead, one of the shelving units suddenly crashed over with an earth-shaking bang of twisting metal. Reflexively, we raised our weapons and aimed our lights down the shadowy aisle, and that's when it came scrambling towards us out of the darkness. This thing, maybe five feet tall, hairless and with pale, sickly grayish-blue skin, stretched taut over its bony frame. Its arms were elongated, and its legs bent backwards like an animal's. But its eyes seemed to glow with their own dim light. And the mouth. When that mouth opened up in a deafening screech, it split open inhumanly wide to reveal rows of teeth. I'm not ashamed to admit that shriek paralyzed me for a few endless seconds. Never in my life had I heard something so bone-chillingly unnatural. The thing scrambled straight towards us with shocking speed on those bent legs and claw-tipped hands, knocking debris out of its path like it was nothing. Right before it reached us, it veered off to the right and shot past into the maze of shelving units, those horrid screeches echoing off the walls. Did you see that? Did you even see that? Bill was shouting, his voice cracking. My heart felt like it was going to explode out of my chest. I was consumed by sheer terror the likes of which I'd never experienced. In that moment, I knew beyond any doubt that thing, that creature, was something not of this world. Call it in, I yelled to Bill, snapping out of my daze. We need backup and paramedics now. As Bill hurriedly radioed for assistance, I cautiously moved forward with my weapon raised. Heading deeper into that hellish labyrinth of debris, I scanned the dimly lit rows ahead, dreading what new horror might be lying in wait. That ungodly, rancid odor only grew thicker and more suffocating with every step. It was like I'd become suspended in a cloud of death. What the hell was this place? After clearing one aisle and then the next, I waved Bill to follow me. With our lights sweeping every shadow, we moved further in, clearing row after row of that nightmarish junkyard with weapons drawn. But the creature was nowhere to be found. No sign of blood or other evidence it had even been injured at all. We searched top to bottom, every shadowy nook and cranny of that place. Until finally, about 15 minutes later, the cavalry arrived. A dozen more squad cars, their sirens wailing as they tore in through the factory gates. When several officers rushed over to us amid that hellacious reek and dim lighting, the looks on their faces said it all. They could see in our eyes that something deeply disturbing had happened here. What is that smell? One of them gasped out. I just shook my head, unable to find the words to describe what Bill and I had witnessed, let alone that foul, ungodly stench. We showed the team where we'd first encountered the thing, and they quickly fanned out to search every inch of that place. But it was no use. Whatever that creature was, it had truly vanished without a trace. I stayed on scene until sunrise when we just had to call it. After hours of scouring that nightmare factory with no luck, we bagged any evidence we could find, which wasn't much at all. To this day, I have no rational explanation for what Bill and I encountered in that godforsaken place. Where could that thing have come from? What was it doing there in the first place? Every cop has a few stories of weird, disturbing cases that can never be solved. But this... This was something else entirely. 
I'd looked true evil square in the eyes that night. Something jarring and unnatural that shook me to my very core. Maybe it's better I don't know the full truth of what we saw. Some mysteries I've realized are better left unsolved and removed from your memory, because thinking about them can just make you totally feel crazy. It was a crystal clear night in early September when this next bizarre encounter happened. Ranger Edwards was doing his usual patrol around the Shoshone Lake area of Yellowstone, making sure there were no illegal campfires or lost hikers wandering about after dark. The moon was full and bright that night, allowing him to see far into the thick pine forest surrounding the lake. Little did he know about the terrifying encounter that was about to happen to him. But here's the story in his own words. Around 11 p.m., I had stopped to take a break near one of the small streams that feed into Shoshone Lake. As I was sipping some water from my canteen, I suddenly heard a deep grunting sound coming from the trees probably 200 yards to my west. It wasn't like any animal call I was familiar with in that area, way too low and guttural to be a bear, and it didn't have that higher pitched wheezing sound that elk make when calling. I immediately grabbed my radio to report the strange noise, but before I could unmute it, there was another grunt, even louder and deeper than the first one. That's when I saw movement through the tree trunks. Something massive, at least eight feet tall from what I could make out in the moonlight, was lumbering and swaying slowly in my direction. I just watched, trying to comprehend what the hell I was seeing emerge from the darkness of the forest. As this thing got closer, blocking out more and more of the moonlight, I could make out additional unsettling details. It had bulky, rounded shoulders like a bodybuilder, but its legs looked almost too skinny and tapered to possibly support the weight of that massive upper body. And by far the most chilling detail that became visible, those dead, vacant eyes that reflected the moon like two dull mirrors. Whatever this creature was, it had to weigh over 500 pounds, maybe even 600 or 700. Now I've seen plenty of bears here in Yellowstone, including some huge male grizzlies, but this thing completely dwarfed even the biggest grizzly. And the way it moved was so unnatural and twisted, like its immense weight was just an afterthought as it effortlessly lurched from side to side, swaying its bulky frame. By now, the creature was around 100 feet away from me, I remember frantically trying to find my voice to radio the station and call for backup, but my mouth was completely dry from sheer terror. That's when the monster stopped moving and slowly turned its head towards me, almost as if it could sense my presence. Our eyes met through the inky darkness, and in that moment, a surge of fear and dread shot through my entire body, and nothing, absolutely nothing, compares to the pants-wetting, visceral terror I felt when locking eyes with this non-human thing that somehow looked vaguely familiar and at the same time utterly alien. Those lifeless cold eyes just bored directly into me with an intelligence that made my blood freeze in my veins. In that eternally long moment, my mind raced, trying in vain to find any logical explanation for what I was witnessing, some grasp of reality to hold on to. But there was no context for this creature's existence. No frame of reference to make any sense of the horrific sight in front of me. The creature just continued its predatory staring routine for what felt like forever, occasionally opening its big mouth to release more of those bone-chilling growls. Panic slowly crept back into my mind as I realized I was completely at this thing's mercy, powerless against whatever its intentions were. Just when it felt like the tension was about to burst, the creature took two thunderous steps backwards, never breaking our shared stare. It then turned to its right and continued its bizarre, lumbering movement off into the dark woods, disappearing behind the trees and underbrush. But I could still hear its grunts and growls fading into the distance. I stayed there for at least 30 minutes after it left, not willing to make even the slightest move until I was absolutely certain it was gone. My heart was pounding like crazy, Ears were ringing, and I could feel sweat dripping down the back of my neck as the rush of adrenaline started to fade. When I thought it was safe, I slowly bent down to pick up my radio. But just as I did, I heard an incredibly loud thud, 
like a nearby tree had been struck with massive force. The radio slipped from my trembling hands and fell to the ground again as I doubled over and threw up, utterly shaken to my core. I looked around in a panic, trying to figure out where the noise came from, but saw nothing in any direction. That's when I heard a series of faint knocks, almost like someone rapping their knuckles against wood. Tap, 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 slowly getting louder and more pronounced with each repetition. I spun around, trying to find the source, when a deafening crack rang out from directly behind me. I wheeled around to see a massive tree trunk, easily three feet wide, get sheared straight through about eight feet off the ground. The top portion froze in midair for a split second, before crashing downwards with an earth-shaking boom, sending a tremor through the ground that I could feel in my bones. In a blind panic, I turned to run, but stopped dead in my tracks when I saw that hulking figure emerge again from the darkness ahead of me. We re-established that soul-piercing lock stare as it opened its big mouth once more to let out a roar. My legs transformed into rubber and buckled underneath me as I collapsed onto my hands and knees, utterly paralyzed by fear. As it approached to within 15 feet, it reared up onto its hind legs using its gangly arms to push itself to its full, towering height. Even on all fours, I could feel the tremors of its footsteps reverberating through the ground. Up close, the sheer mass and power of this thing was overwhelming. As it reared up, still letting out those deep growls, I could see the sunken, soulless eyes more clearly. They were a pale, milky white with no pupils or irises. Then, it opened its mouth to reveal two rows of thick, blunt, yellow teeth that would have been more at home on a great white shark. A putrid, fishy stench issued forth, making me gag involuntarily as I feebly attempted to crawl backwards. With one thunderous step forward, the creature lowered its arm and shoved an enormous hand towards me, the grotesque fingers splaying outwards as it reached in my direction. In that moment, a scream finally found its way through my paralyzed vocal cords as I let out an ear-piercing shriek of pure primal terror. The scream only seemed to spur the thing onwards as it leaned further towards me, opening its mouth to expose its full tangle of razor-sharp fangs. I shut my eyes tightly and turned my head away, trying in vain to mentally escape the nightmare. Just then, a new series of loud cracks rang out through the woods sounding like gunshots from far away. The creature immediately froze, cocked its head slightly. I reluctantly opened my eyes to see it hastily turning away from me to face the direction the noises had come from. It hunched its massive shoulders as a series of unintelligible grunts and growls. That's when I noticed movement through the trees, flashlight beams scattered in multiple directions, seemingly searching and converging on our location. The creature continued its guttural ranting. Then, without warning, it turned and gave me with one final doleful glare. I didn't dare move as the creature held that last lingering gaze. Then, it turned and lumbered off into the darkness, disappearing from my field of view. The crashing and shouts through the trees grew closer, until finally a beam of light landed on me, still frozen on my hands and knees. As park rangers swarmed into the clearing, I could only let out a few incoherent sobs and babblings, alternating between trying to warn them and reassure myself that whatever I had just witnessed couldn't possibly be real. Edwards, you okay, buddy? What the hell happened out here? Shouted Ranger Olson as he pulled me to my feet. I just shook my head dumbly, unable to find the words to explain the horrifying encounter. The other Rangers quickly fanned out sweeping their flashlight beams across the trampled brush and snapped branches. I could hear their confused murmurs carrying across the stillness. You're not going to believe this. What could have done this type of damage? Never seen anything like it. Olsen tried to get my attention again. Mike, listen to me. Are you injured? Did you see what did this? I finally managed a few broken words. Huge. Creature. It was... Suddenly... The deafening crack of a large tree snapping apart just beyond the clearing caused everyone to instinctively take cover. I dropped to the ground, covering my head as thunderous crashes rained down through the forest canopy, shaking the earth with every impact. 
You hear that? One of the rangers whispered urgently. Sounds just like the reports that came in last summer from over by Beckler Meadows. Same low bellows and growls. My breath caught in my chest as I recounted the details from that case. Several groups of hikers reporting an encounter with a massive, hair-covered, bipedal creature that let out haunting groans and bellows. The reports were never taken terribly seriously, since no conclusive evidence was ever found. But in that moment, I knew those witnesses had indeed experienced the very same horror I just had. Which meant whatever that thing was, it was still out there in the wilderness, silently stalking anyone unfortunate enough to cross its path. Come on, we need to get out of here, Olson stated firmly as he helped pull me back to my feet. The other rangers formed a tight perimeter around us, rifles at the ready, as we began making our way back down the trail and towards the access road. With every step, I couldn't help but scan the dense tree lines feverishly, imagining those pale, lifeless eyes watching our every move from the blackness between the pines. The sinking realization was setting in that we might be the ones being hunted. The hike out seemed to take an eternity, with every stray sound or unexpected movement causing the entire group to start and tense up. No one was eager to take point on the narrow winding path. Finally, after what felt like hours of painstaking progress, we emerged at the trailhead and relative safety of our waiting trucks. A few rangers who had been posted there rushed over in curiosity until seeing the ashen, haunted expressions on all our faces. I finally felt a wave of relief begin to wash over me, allowing my mind to slowly restart and process some of what I had endured. As I leaned heavily against the closest truck, Catherine, the most seasoned ranger on the force, stepped up and placed a reassuring hand on my shoulder. You know, there's been stories told around these parts for centuries. Legends from the native tribes about massive, upright beasts that roamed the forest and were feared by all. She stated somberly, knowingly. Doesn't seem so far-fetched anymore, does it? As I dragged my gaze up to meet hers, I knew the thousand-yard stare in her eyes all too well. She had encountered something inexplicable out there too, at some point. We both had been forced to confront the reality that humans may not be the true apex predators. Finally, as I stared blankly up at the endless, starlit sky through the boughs, a solitary, mournful bellow rang out across the valley, making us all instinctively start and tense up once more. And in that instant, I knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that my life, all our lives, would never be the same. The sad truth was, those ancient tales of wood spirits and territorial monsters were not merely fables, but real and actual warnings. As we climbed into the trucks and slowly pulled away, I kept my eyes on the towering silhouettes of the pines gradually receding in the side mirrors. I knew in my heart that whatever that thing was, it remained out there, lurking where it's difficult to find. But still, I had no doubt whatsoever that our paths would most likely, unavoidably, cross once again in the future, and I just knew I needed to be prepared. It was April 18, 2022, when 32-year-old Matt Reynolds went scuba diving off the coast of Big Pine Key in the Florida Keys. Matt was an experienced diver who liked to explore the reefs and shipwrecks in these waters whenever he got a chance. That morning, the skies were clear, and the ocean waters looked calm and inviting. Matt loaded up his truck with all his scuba gear, his mask, buoyancy compensator, air tank, regulator, fins, and mesh bag to collect any interesting finds. He also packed a couple bottles of water and a sandwich for after the dive. Matt launched his 21-foot boat from the public ramp in Big Pine Key shortly after 10 a.m. He motored approximately three miles offshore to an area known as Little Munson Island, which had some healthy coral reefs in 30 to 40 feet of water. This was one of Matt's favorite dive spots, as it was usually uncrowded compared to the more popular Lou Key Reef system further south. After arriving at the dive site and performing his safety checks, Matt put on his scuba gear and rolled backwards off the boat into the clear blue water. He descended slowly, following his bubbles up to the surface 
as his eye adjusted to the filtered sunlight at depth. The reef was teeming with life. Matt spotted bright yellow French grunts, a huge green moray eel poking its head out, and several spindly spotted toadfish camouflaged on the bottom. One of his favorite finds was a small abandoned conch shell, home to a vibrant red and white candy striped shrimp. About 20 minutes into his dive at a depth of around 35 feet, Matt noticed something very unusual partially buried in the sandy bottom ahead. At first, he thought it might be a nurse shark resting, which wouldn't be that uncommon. But as he got closer, he realized this was definitely no shark. Lying mostly covered in the white sand was some kind of reptilian creature Matt had never seen before, not even in books or on nature documentaries. Its body was around six feet long, pretty thick through the middle, and was covered in rough, ridged green scales. The tail looked very powerful and substantial as it slowly lashed back and forth. But the thing that really made Matt's eyes go wide behind his mask was the massive head attached to the creature. It was easily two feet across, with two protruding black eyes on either side that seemed devoid of any sense of reason or intelligence. The jaws looked unnaturally large, filled with multiple rows of long fangs that curved backwards into the mouth. As Matt cautiously finned closer, he could see that the creature seemed to be injured. One of its front limbs or flippers was bent at an unnatural angle and wasn't moving. The creature was just lying in the sand, occasionally flicking its tail back and forth but otherwise unmoving. Matt stopped a few feet away and just hovered there, mesmerized by this incredible finding, but also feeling a rising sense of fear and unease. He had never seen anything like this before not even at the deepest depths he'd explored. Sea snakes and large moray eels were as exotic as it got in the Florida waters. Suddenly, the gigantic reptilian head slowly turned towards Matt, fixing him with those cold, dead-looking black eyes. Matt felt his heart beginning to pound harder in his chest as the creature opened its cavernous jaws, releasing a low guttural groan audible even underwater. That's when Matt's survival instincts kicked in. He turned and began finning away from the strange creature as fast as he could. He desperately wanted to observe it longer, to capture video to show others. But there was just something so prehistoric, so primordial about this being that triggered a deep, innate sense of flight over fight. Matt didn't look back as he headed for the surface, grateful when his head finally broke through, and he could draw in lungfuls of fresh air. He quickly swam over to his idling boat and hauled himself up and in, arms shaking slightly from the adrenaline still coursing through his body. In over two decades of diving all around the Caribbean, Pacific, and Florida, Matt had never had an encounter quite like that. Part of him wished he had stayed to observe the creature longer, but a larger part of him was relieved he trusted his instincts to get away from that strange being. These days, Matt is more cautious when diving especially in areas he's never explored before. While he continues to dive regularly, he's always on the lookout for any signs of that strange reptilian creature, or others like it. Part of him feels driven to try and capture evidence to prove what he saw that day was real. He's purchased an underwater camera housing and lights for his DSLR, just in case he gets another encounter. At the same time, a bigger part of Matt understands there are things in the depths of the ocean that are best left alone or observed from a distance. He knows the fight or flight instinct he felt that April Day was there for a reason. To protect him from creatures and environments, humans may not be equipped to handle. So while the memory of locking eyes with that prehistoric looking beast is permanently etched into his mind, Matt tries not to dwell on it too much. He simply aims to continue enjoying the wonders the ocean has to offer while also respecting that there are some mysteries that may be better left unfound. It was an unseasonably warm evening in late October of 2015 when park ranger David Miller began his rounds through the dense forest of Salt Fork State Park in eastern Ohio. David had been a ranger for just under 16 years and thought he had seen and experienced just about everything that this park could throw at him. But what happened that night in October 
would test his every last nerve. David parked his truck at one of the remote trailheads and set out on foot, flashlight in hand. About a mile into his patrol, David's nostrils were suddenly assaulted by a putrid, rotting stench, like that of decaying flesh. He slowed his pace, scanning the tree line with his light. Up ahead, David noticed an unusual series of large footprints pressed into the soft dirt, definitely not belonging to any creature he could identify. The prints seemed to weave between the trees in an erratic pattern, as if whatever made them had been staggering drunkenly through the forest. David's senses heightened as he followed the bizarre trail, deeper into the shadows cast by the looming pines and oaks. After several hundred more yards, the stench became overpowering and David raised his shirt collar over his nose to block out the rancid odor. That's when he saw it, crouched near the base of a huge fallen tree, drooling strands of saliva from its yellowed fangs, was the most grotesque, nightmarish beast David had ever witnessed. It was easily seven feet tall, leaning forward on two muscular, hair-covered legs that ended in powerful claws. Its torso and arms were similarly covered in shaggy black fur like some wild prehistoric wolf, but its elongated animalistic snout and razor-sharp teeth belonged more to a demented hellhound than any natural predator. As their eyes met, the creature reared back, letting out a deafening, multi-toned roar. The creature then took a lumbering step toward David, dragging one of its powerful claws against the tree trunk and shredding deep gouges into the bark as if it were wet cardboard. David's military training should have kicked in, telling him to turn and run or prepare to fight for his life. But he stood motionless, his mind unable to process what his eyes were witnessing. The beast slowly closed the distance between them, each thunderous footstep shaking the ground beneath David's boots. Its lips curled back. Strands of saliva and strands of blood-stained fur hung from its snarling jaw. Only ten yards separated him from the monster now. David could feel warm, putrid blasts of the creature's breath, hitting his face in waves with each snort of its drooling snout. That's when he noticed the prominent ridges along its skeletal brow, protruding like bony horns. Whatever this ungodly thing was, it was no ordinary animal, and the way it stared directly into David's eyes, unblinking and unwavering, sent a surge of raw fear through him, the kind he had never experienced not even during his years of combat overseas. This was the stuff of nightmares given form and flesh, a living remnant of the most horrific bedtime stories, and it had him paralyzed in its crosshairs. The creature drew a lengthy inhale through those skull-like nostrils, as if savoring his scent. A gurgling growl then rumbled from its massive chest. Then the creature's roar shattered the silence of the forest like a thunderclap. David's heart pounded in his chest, as if it were trying to escape his ribcage, every muscle in his body screaming at him to move, to run, to fight, anything but stand there helpless. Then, delivering another hellish snarl, the beast turned its broad, fur-matted back toward David and took several lurching steps away. He could hear its thick claws gouging fresh trenches into the soft forest floor with every step. Was it leaving? David wanted desperately to believe so, but his gut told him this was no ordinary predator, merely giving up on easy prey. There was something far more disturbing, more sinister about this thing's behavior, as if it were toying with him, making him think that all was okay. And David was right. The creature was toying with him, because the next thing that happened was that the creature's powerful haunches tensed under its matted pelt and David's military instincts finally kicked back in. Just as the beast unleashed another reverberating roar and whipped around to charge, David spun on his heel and sprinted back along the trail toward his truck as fast as his feet could carry him. He didn't dare look back, didn't slow his frantic pace for an instant. Branches whipped across his face, drawing blood as he tore through the woodland. David's heart thundered, his lungs burning from exertion and sheer panic. His boots pounded against the dirt trail as he ran blindly through the inky darkness, the beam of his flashlight bouncing wildly. He couldn't let that ungodly monster catch him. He wouldn't survive the encounter. Up ahead, David saw the reassuring sight of his truck, 
through the tangled branches and underbrush. Just a little further, he thought. He willed his legs to keep pumping, to push past the searing pain. That's when a tremendous force slammed into David's back, like a freight train hitting him at full speed. Massive claws sank through his thick ranger's jacket, searing his flesh. White-hot agony exploded across his shoulder blades as he was lifted off the ground by those terrible talons. The creature roared in his ear, spraying his face with hot, putrid spittle as David was whipped around to come face to face with the beast's gaping mouth. Its eyes burned into his, full of primal hunger and hate. Then, just as suddenly, the ranger felt himself being flung aside like a rag doll, smashing against the unforgiving trunk of a pine tree. He collapsed in a heap, dazed and gasping for air as agony lanced through his back. When David regained his senses mere seconds later, he saw the hulking silhouette of the monster slowly retreating back into the forest depths, its rumbling growls fading into the night. David scrambled to his feet, half crawling the remaining distance to the blessed safety of his truck's cab. Locking the doors, he turned the key and threw the vehicle into gear, tires peeling out and spraying gravel as he tore out of the trailhead parking area. David didn't stop driving until the forest was far behind him, the warm glow of city lights and civilization up ahead. When he got home, he tore off his clothes and jumped in a hot shower and stood there until the water ran cold trying to forget the whole ordeal. From there, he tried to push it all aside and not think about it, hoping that if he didn't think about it, the ordeal would leave his mind. But to this day, he still grapples with what happened to him, and he shared with me that telling his story here is his way of trying to move on, to become himself again, just like before it all happened. It was a bitterly cold late December night, around 11 p.m., when high-wire electrician John Walters found himself out in the middle of nowhere, working to repair a downed power line deep in the rural Kansas countryside. The closest town was over 15 miles away, and the only light for miles was the dim glow of his truck's headlights and the occasional flicker of the power lines overhead. John had been called out to this remote location after an intense ice storm had swept through the area, coating the power lines and utility poles with a thick layer of ice. The weight of the ice had caused multiple lines to snap and poles to collapse, leaving dozens of farms and homes without electricity. As the lead lineman on the repair crew, it was John's job to scale the tall wooden utility poles and assess the damage before the crew came in. After hours of grueling work in the bitter cold, Repairing broken lines and replacing damaged poles, John and his crew were just about finished with the last repair on the line. John had climbed back down the pole and was gathering some tools when he noticed something strange out of the corner of his eye. At first, he thought it was just a trick of the light, or his eyes playing tricks on him in the dark. But as he peered closer, he realized there was a large, dark shape moving slowly through the tall, frozen grass about 100 yards away. The shape seemed to be walking on two legs, but seemed to be much taller and bulkier than a human. As it moved, the grass seemed to part and sway, as if something massive was pushing through it. John felt his body run cold, but he tried to push the uneasy feeling aside and focus on finishing his work. Squinting his eyes, John tried to make out more details, but the darkness and distance made it difficult. The shape was moving with a strange, lumbering gait, seemingly unaffected by the freezing temperatures and icy terrain. John watched, transfixed, as it disappeared into the shadows of the adjacent tree line. Shaking his head, John tried to convince himself that it must have been a deer or some other large animal. But something about the way it moved, the sheer size of the shadowy figure, just didn't seem right. A nagging sense of unease settled in the pit of his stomach. Just as John was reconnecting the final cable, he suddenly felt a prickling sensation on the back of his neck, as if he was being watched. Glancing up, he scanned the darkness, but could see nothing except the faint outline of the bare trees swaying in the icy wind. Dismissing it as his imagination, John climbed down the pole and began packing up his tools. As he was loading the last of the equipment into his truck, 
he suddenly heard a loud guttural growl coming from the darkness. Whirling around, he peered out into the night but saw nothing. The sound had been so strange and unsettling that it made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. Hurrying to get into his truck, John kept glancing nervously over his shoulder, half expecting to see some kind of monstrous figure emerge from the shadows. But the night remained still and silent, save for the occasional creaking of the power lines overhead. As John drove away, he couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that he was being watched. He kept glancing in his rearview mirror, but saw nothing except the empty road behind him, stretching out into the darkness. The memory of the strange lurching shape and the unsettling growl haunted him. A week later, John had to go back to the same place for another job. He felt nervous, thinking about what had happened the last time. He kept looking around, half expecting to see the mysterious figure again, but nothing showed itself this time. Just as he was almost finished, he thought he saw the dark shape again lurking in the distance, but it disappeared too quickly to be sure. When his work was finally done, John hurried to his truck, eager to get back to the safety of the main road. As he pulled away, he couldn't resist the urge to glance in his rearview mirror one last time. To his surprise, he thought he caught another glimpse of a large, dark shape moving through the trees. But just as before, it was gone in an instant, swallowed by the darkness. John shuddered, his hands gripping the steering wheel tightly. He knew that what he had seen or thought he had seen, was not something that could be easily explained away. As the winter dragged on, John's unease only grew. He found himself constantly on edge, jumping at the slightest unusual sound or movement. The PTSD he was experiencing was nothing to take lightly. It was literally taking over his body. The memory of that growl and the feeling of being watched had left a deep, unsettling impression on him that he now felt every second of every day. But John was convinced that he couldn't be the only one who had experienced something like this in the Kansas countryside. But the more he searched, the more it seemed like he was, in fact, the only one who had encountered this exact elusive creature. The not knowing, the uncertainty, was almost worse than the encounter itself. But that's easy to say in retrospect. Still, John couldn't shake the feeling that there was something out there, lurking in the shadows just out of sight, wherever he was. And the thought that it might be still out there, watching and waiting, made him unable to concentrate on his daily activities. To this day, John is not sure what he saw or heard that night. All he knows is that it was not something that is supposed to exist. He wonders if he'll ever get the chance to uncover the truth, or if the mystery of that dark figure growling in the distance, will remain forever unsolved.